get started. Uh, uh, our speaker today is Dr. Nambi Seshadri from uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, he is a distinguished professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and consulting chief technology officer at Quantanet Communications. He has a track record of contributing to successful research programs at the AT&T Bell Laboratory, AT&T Labs, as well as creating and building an multi-billion dollar wireless business at Broadcom. He's a fellow of IEEE, member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, board member of the Indian Ac National Academy of Engineering, and holds about 200 patents. He received the Alexander Graham Bell Medal from IEEE. Let's give him a warm knock. Thank you so much. Uh, now let me turn this on. I can't, uh, my voice is usually louder, but I've been having allergic uh, uh, fits of cough, uh, so I need to, need to speak a little bit softly today. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, it's fine. Hear me at the back? Now then? Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks, Henry, for coming. I just dropped a note to Henry yesterday saying I'll be here giving a talk, and uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's... Uh, very happy to, I mean, honored to have Henry here too. So, uh, you know, when I uh, uh, retired from Broadcom, one of the things that uh, uh, fascinated me, and actually this was motivated by a, uh, I went uh, several years ago to what is known as the annual Tom Kailath lecture at Stanford. Uh, Kailath, many of you may know, or many of you may not know, uh, very uh, well-known EE professor who has contributed in so many different areas and they have an annual lecture in his honor and that particular talk was given by Kunat uh, and uh, Professor Don Kunat who is also like the father of computer science uh, and uh, one of the things he was actually criticizing and lamenting the fact was that historians do an unbelievably terrible job of actually documenting uh, evidence, uh, you know, of uh, what really uh, has transpired in these areas, especially in a young field like computer science, where pretty much all the pioneers of computer science more or less are actually alive. So you should be able to get actual programs, you should be able to talk to them, document everything, how they did it, what. <coughs> and I thought actually cellular is one such field. You know, it's really a very young field, you know, thinking about it. Uh, and so th it became a little bit of a pet project for me but being a researcher and being a technical guy and not a historian, uh, I, my framework was slightly different, which is I started thinking, if I now have to teach a course, let's say on cellular systems, uh, uh, you know, at a fairly technical level, at a fairly technical level, what would be the 10 most important papers that I would actually make students read? That was kind of the starting point. Uh, so that's how I started thinking about it. and. Uh, 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 you know uh, the uh, and that led to a little bit of uh, you know historical uh, perspective as well uh, and that's what so the focus is pretty much let's call it the last 50 years of wireless uh, most of you were not born uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know uh, probably not even born when the first uh, digital systems uh, you know uh, uh, were uh, made commercial. Uh, you know, we were, Yender and myself uh, were working, I think, uh, at the labs at that point. Uh, uh, first 3G systems, Hamid probably started uh, working at AT&T Labs, but uh, our uh, lives in the space, and Henry, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, st starting in 2G for sure, probably saw the first analog phones too. Uh, so anyway, so we are old-timers. So that's the, uh, so it's coming from that perspective, what are the main technical contributions? Uh, and uh, let's see how it goes for the next hour. Uh, another thing, I'm welcome, uh, folks who, uh, you're welcome to criticize, welcome to contribute. We can have a healthy discussion about all of this. So one of the very interesting things I discovered was this uh, 1990 photograph of this person, I think pronounced as Greb. Uh, uh, apparently the WCBS uh, New York City station was started by him. Uh, and he was a pioneer of radio telephones, and he was specifically interested in mobile radio telephones, so he had wired up actually a car that you can see there with all that antenna mass on top. Uh, I saw uh, 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 Frank here somewhere. Uh, so Frank, uh, good to see you. So 
very, very early uh, uh, mobile car systems uh, that this guy built, and he was actually receiving signals, uh, picking up radio signals, and he actually talked about the fact that if my car is stuck, I can actually dial uh, and get emergency person to come and actually move my car around and those kinds of things. So he actually had thought about, uh, you know, kind of uh, emergency applications and need for those kinds of things and communicate. So he was actually built prototype systems and apparently ran WCBS for many years. Uh, so that was him. Uh, uh, so that's kind of a very, very early and uh, I couldn't find some interesting notes. Uh, Louis Carroll apparently, this was from another very well known uh, and also a his history buff of wireless, Nelson Sollenberger had actually sent me some interesting notes uh, from actually talking about, uh, I think this may have been uh, either H.G. Wells or uh, uh, someone like that, uh, going way, way back into the very, very early 19th century talk, or 20th century talking about a device we will be carrying in our hand mm -hmm. and doing some very interesting, what if we can do that and things of that kind. I couldn't find that, but uh, 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 a lot of history, uh, people actually thinking about what we can do with mobile technology, what we can do with a device in our hands, and so on. Uh, so I have a slightly different perspective in how I present the, uh, uh, my view today. Uh, we all know about 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and so on, and similarly in Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is at a Wi-Fi 6.0 right now, always one step ahead of uh, cellular, which is at 5G, Wi-Fi needs to be at 6. Uh, so. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, I will talk about uh, 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 you know a slightly different view, which is my own view, which I call it as mobile and wireless one through four, uh, and uh, looking a little bit, which is really where I will spend 99% of my time, and then hopefully can throw in some challenges for uh, at least the uh, systems people, uh, radio systems people, to look at for uh, things going forward. Uh, so we'll see where we are. Uh, so the uh, first generation technology uh, is, uh, you know, mobile and wireless. It was really driven by, uh, so the topmost, and this is a slide that uh, uh, I think, Henry, you created way, way back, uh, and I keep adding to it. Uh, the top line is uh, wireless LAN and PAN technologies. The bottom line is uh, cellular technologies, and going way back, uh, mobile and wireless one revolution was uh, all about analog was. You know, uh, uh, in the 1970s, the first cellular uh, systems were tried and then got deployed in the very early 80s, and they were purely focused on analog voice technology. Uh, and uh, uh, this was probably the story until, uh, I'm going to say, mid-80s. Uh, and again, these are things that you, uh, you know, many of you won't know. In 84, there was a very famous uh, uh, split of uh, what was Marvel AT&T, which was a monopoly into long distance and regional companies. And one of the things they had to decide What's, what's going to happen to the world of cellular technology? Who actually owns the world of cellular? Should it be a part of the long distance business or should it be part of all these local companies, you know, uh, 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 so-called baby bells? Uh, this included uh, uh, who owns the cellular spectrum, who provides the services, who builds the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, should they even be in that business? And uh, without uh, going into details, they essentially commissioned uh, one of the very, very, very famous uh, consulting agencies to figure out what they should do. And that consulting company said, ditch the entire cellular business because the world is not going to adopt cellular. Uh, by the end of 2000, we will probably see one million subscribers. Uh, so it's not worth being in the cellular business. So just to give you a trend off, it's very hard to predict the future. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, this was the, the end of analog voice was when I joined Bell Labs, which was 1986. Uh, and I had the fortune of working on uh, uh, very, you know, uh, uh, Hamid and I, were, and I were talking about it today, and Ender, I can, few can agree with it too. Essentially, the, this place would just pick up good, you know, very, hopefully, you know, very bright, but what they, who they think are very bright people, and they will just put them to, hey, do what you like, kind of a thing. And uh, uh, my very first day, I was actually told, uh, it would be very nice if you can work on this problem of uh, transmitting voice reliably over wireless channels. Uh, uh, it was not uh, mandated that I should work on it, but I was told it would be nice if you can work on that. Uh, so that actually gave me a sense of purpose and direction. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working on the second generation uh, digital systems, not CDMA, but uh, uh, what was called, you know, this was a system that probably most of you have not used called IS-136, which was the uh, very first digital system deployed in uh, North America. And then uh, 
uh, which then became, sorry, it was IS-54, which then became IS-136, uh, and then uh, 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 GSM, uh, uh, or evolution of GSM called Edge Technology. That was a huge area of focus for me from uh, 86 to mid-90s uh, to about 94. Uh, so that was a, 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 a huge, huge learning experience with a primary focus on uh, how to uh, do voice communications better, uh, as well as uh, beginning of packet data. Uh, how do we essentially do packet data reliably over cellular channels? Uh, but that pretty much occupied, uh, you know, uh, so when I worked on this, it pretty much paralleled what went on with regards to wireless. There was no wireless, there was, if there was wireless LAN, uh, there was very little uh, of actual deployment. Uh, there were some initial uh, proprietary technologies that were being developed at Bell Labs and various other labs in Europe. Bell Labs stopped the work on wireless technologies uh, because of other than cellular, uh, as I was talking about. Uh, uh, European work continued at that point, but there was actually no deployment of wireless LAN okay, at that point. Uh, that was second generation. And then moving on, uh, uh, third generation, uh, so you can roughly think of this as 75 to 85, this was 85 to 95, then you began to get into the 95 to 2005 time frame, which was the third generation of mobile and wireless. Uh, at the top, you are now beginning to see the deployment of very early wireless LAN technology, which really took off uh, with 802.11G uh, technology, <laughs> which was the time frame around which I also moved to Broadcom. Uh, and uh, Broadcom became a, uh, a pioneer in uh, developing very efficient, uh, uh, ultra low cost and low, you know, small form factor uh, wireless LAN, uh, all, all uh, integrated single chip technologies uh, that really spurred the deployment of wireless LAN in, first of all, in PCs. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of 2005, mid 2005, uh, we also started the low power wireless LAN, which actually carriers didn't want in cell phones, but we really pushed that very hard wireless LAN and more important Bluetooth uh, uh, along with Motorola. So that's the wireless band technology. So that uh, really was a, uh, let's call it a late 90s to uh, uh, mid 2000s technology effort and the very, very early deployments happened in that time frame. Uh, uh, by mid 2000s, uh, PCs, laptops pretty much were all wireless LAN equipped uh, of various kinds. F you're beginning to see phones. Uh, 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 Bluetooth was becoming kind of a norm, but really uh, the big Bluetooth uh, explosion happened with uh, uh, Broadcom uh, uh, really driving down the cost of uh, Bluetooth as well as wireless LAN, uh, putting them together on single chip and driving that whole area, which really spurred the whole wireless activity of Broadcom. So that was, uh, uh, yeah, let's call it 2005, then moving on to 4.0, uh, you began to see more and more of uh, wireless LAN uh, uh, at the top. Oh, I forgot the 3G. I will come to that. The, on the bottom side on 3.0 is the, all the mobile side. You began to see a uh, little bit more of multimedia messaging. Very early forays into uh, messaging uh, uh, multimedia with uh, 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 you know, cameras coming into phones uh, in early 2000s uh, and people being able to take uh, uh, very low quality pictures uh, uh, packet, people are beginning to think about packet data, but within the confines of how to take an existing cellular network and add packet data. It was not an IP network. It was a very cellular uh, uh, view, carrier, classic carrier view of how packet data should be put into your circuit network uh, and trying to kind of jam packet data into your circuit network world. Uh, and uh, uh, so-called GPRS technologies and edge technologies and Evolutions of CDMA all happened around that time frame to roughly around 100, megabit, 100 kilobits to about a few hundred kilobits of data happened in that time frame. Uh, uh, and people are able to do some very interesting uh, low bitrate data services with that, uh, which really uh, spurred the development of 4G saying, hey, you know, this is all wonderful, but we really need to get on to the next stage. You began to see very uh, nice combination of, uh, uh, again, due to the <coughs> silicon uh, uh, Moore's law, uh, uh, you know, as by 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, Broadcom was working on technologies and Qualcomm's and others were working on technologies of how do we put HD video into phones? How do we essentially do 12 megapixel cameras uh, uh, all the way to 24? So we were doing chips like uh, 1080p, 60 frames or 30 frames by 2005, 2006. 
uh, we were trying to do 200 megapixel per second throughput of uh, JPEG, uh, of uh, raw image capture uh, uh, and being, or sorry, of uh, raw image capture and hence being able to do, uh, 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 you know, say 10 frames to 20 frames of uh, uh, JPEG at 10 to 12 megabits. Uh, dual cameras, all those kinds of things we were beginning to think about because silicon needs to happen about five to six years in advance of when you will actually see a product. Uh, uh, it takes about three to four years for the silicon to all mature and for the uh, handset manufacturers to adopt and then you see another two years before which, especially new technologies, before you see uh, those technologies coming into uh, the market. So uh, driven a lot by Nokia, driven a lot by iPhone, those kinds of things happen in the mid 2000s in the handset world, but driving then the need for data, and then the applications started coming along the social media, the YouTube's, Facebooks, etc. So all that essentially, and then you are now beginning to evolve the network into an IP network. Uh, simultaneously, wireless LAN technology is getting into 100 megabits to gigabit data rates. Uh, so through the development and first deployments of MIMO technology happening in wireless LAN with 802.11n. So. Uh, uh, and now we are at you know 5.0. So uh, this essentially went from barely a million people of using uh, analog voice worldwide in the 80s, uh, early 80s, to now uh, just about four to five billion people. So a remarkable uh, uh, maturity, you know, maturation of uh, uh, technology in multiple fronts. And uh, the let's spend. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what happened pre-85. Uh, so this is. We are now going to go all the way back to the 1940s. Uh, probably the golden uh, period of invention uh, that really catapulted, in my view, many of the communications uh, uh, technologies we see, see today as well as computing. Of course, probably the most prominent is the invention of the transistor. Uh, 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 the point contact transistor was demoed by Bell Labs on uh, December 23rd, uh, 1947. Uh, uh, it was. Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, Bell Labs realized the significance of it uh, for the purpose of communication. They were trying to replace vacuum tubes for the purpose of switching. Uh, some people actually realized the you know, value of it for computing almost immediately. Uh, uh, if, you guys, if you want to, if, if you're history buffs, you can actually go and look at at and archives on YouTube. There are some wonderful uh, videos of uh, uh, actually the inventors talking about those uh, things. Just a, remarkable set of videos that Bell Labs is beginning to release all them, all of them into YouTube now. Uh, uh, so uh, very interesting to watch that. Uh, the uh, second most important thing along with that, you know, these all, in my view, uh, all, I'm not going to go and categorize this was the second most, but they all you know, were concurrent, was uh, Claude Shannon's work on the mathematical theory of communication, uh, which really set the framework of information theory. Uh, uh, and uh, principles underlying communications. Uh, uh, what is probably not well known is that uh, 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 an engineer called Ring, R-I-N-G, essentially proposed the cellular concept Bell Labs and essentially discussed the whole concept of how a cellular system should be built in 1947, uh, an internal report uh, of Bell Labs. Uh, so uh, uh, that happened uh, in that same time frame. Uh, the, uh, first error correcting code, Hamming, 1948, that happened roughly in that same time frame. Uh, and then uh, probably something we underappreciate and we don't think about it that much, but becoming very, very important is privacy. Uh, uh, and uh, actually one of the things that you should all be, uh, we should all appreciate is that while we have been so concerned about, hey, am I essentially connecting to some unsecured Wi-Fi, we never worry about when we travel the world, we never worry about actually connecting to an unsecured carrier. You know, we just say, oh, that is actually, you know, we have, we have some worries about certain countries now, but leaving that aside, you know, you travel to Europe, you don't worry about, hey, you know, is Vodafone a you know, reliable, an unsecured carrier? The phone actually, you know, roams into Vodafone and you're fine, you're happy connecting. Uh, so, uh, uh, actually, with the, starting with the advent of second generation cellular systems, uh, tremendous importance was placed in authentication, security uh, uh, of uh, uh, voice, security of data, uh, you are who you say you are, all those kinds of things. Uh, uh, so we seldom see too much about, hey, you know, your phone is hacked uh, because uh, uh, someone hacked into your carrier, for example. Right? So uh, 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 tremendous importance placed in the standard from a security point of view. But all this essentially played into uh, 
where well, you know they're probably the most important primary communications tool for today, which is the cellular technology. So now I'm going to now move on to uh, having given that very broad introduction, which has taken a long time. Uh, uh, I'm now going to move on to the ten most important contributions. Uh, uh, so on the right, you see the guys who proposed this, uh, uh, and it was published in a paper in 1957, uh, IRE transactions on uh, wireless com vehicular communications. The notion of frequency reuse. Uh, that is, you take a geographical area, split it into lots of little, 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 little areas, and each and every area will essentially have its own frequency, and that frequency can be only reused at some other point. This has to do with the fact that we have very limited bandwidth. Uh, 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 the notion of a frequency reuse, uh, how to design a cellular system, the first concept, frequency reuse. Uh, uh, and today, it turns out that we still do, you know, uh, in, the, in the very early digital systems, we were essentially reusing a frequency something called a 721, which is if you think of your cell and hex, hex, cell as an hexagon, and then you have six hexagons surrounding it, and you, each hexagon is divided into three sectors. Whatever frequency you're using in one sector, it cannot be used anywhere within that particular hexagon. It cannot be used in any of the surrounding hexagons. It can be only used in an hexagon which is outside of that. That was called a 721 reuse, which was the very early digital systems that were deployed in USA. Uh, uh, today, we think we use frequency reuse one with LTE with all those advances, uh, but uh, even uh, but we do something called partial frequency reuse for those of you who are familiar with uh, the terminology. Uh, so uh, uh, the interior of every cell can reuse the same frequency, but on the edges of a cell, if you think again of a hexagon and then you color it, you have to do you have to use different frequencies at the edge of the cell. And if you think of the area of a cell. Primarily, the edge consists of the biggest portion of the area, and hence, you really look at it, you know, probably 30% of a cell or maybe 25% of a cell is actually doing frequency reuse one. 75% uh, of it is actually doing frequency reuse, which is more than one. Uh, so, uh, uh, frequency reuse is, uh, 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 is, is the norm even today. Uh, and that principle is uh, very important and widely used. Uh, and uh, the next one is the notion of a handoff. Uh, as we, because we are going to be moving, we need to hand off. And the entire concept of how we engineer the system that you essentially have, uh, 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 you know, con you need to now start building control systems. You need to actually start building measurements. Uh, my signal strength is going down, uh, whoever I am connected to, uh, and then I need to uh, hand off to the neighboring <coughs> cell. In the very initial days, you did something called hard handoff, which is you cut the conversation and then you have to reinitiate the conversation and then you get it up with clips. You know, you will actually see that physically there was a handoff going. Then they started thinking about what to do. It moved to something called mobile assisted handoff, which is mobile will say, look, I think it is going down. And then you will initiate a call with the other cell before you terminate the uh, call, the, before you terminate the conversation going on in the current cell. Uh, and uh, then with CDMA technology, we ended up with something called soft handoff where you're actually talking to multiple cells. Uh, uh, and by that itself, each and every one of those uh, is a chapter in itself. We can spend enough time talking about those, but uh, as a principle, handoffs uh, is the second most important concept. Uh, so if you were teaching a course, uh, you know, and we do these 10 most important papers, each and every one of these important topics will have three to four important sub-contributions, and students can actually take those and read those. Uh, and then, the third one is, okay, now that you have uh, uh, created all these cells, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it's all working well, but suddenly, you know, uh, Henry decides that, hey, you know, we are going to bring the ducks in and maybe some other team inside, and you have a Honda stadium with uh, 20,000 people all wanting to talk on a phone, uh, what do we do? Uh, uh, you know, uh, the traffic would overwhelm the macro cell. Uh, so, uh, the notion of cell splitting, which is you, how do you essentially take a large cell which is using one frequency and subdivide it into smaller and smaller chunks. Uh, small, uh, so the notion of small cell, small zone, all those kinds of things uh, uh, ended up happening. Uh, and uh, uh, increasingly, and by the way, this is the biggest way we grow capacity. Think about, actually, I will uh, probably not discuss it, but all the work that uh, Yender has done, Hamid has done, I have done, uh, you know, various other major contributors to wireless communications have done, uh, probably have improved the uh, capacity by maybe a factor of 20 to 40. That's it, from the very early days. Uh, 
uh, whereas the traffic needs have grown exponentially. There are only two ways that really it has been solved. One is by in, you know, adding more and more cells, okay, uh, cell splitting. And the second one is you allocate more and more frequency. <coughs> Those are the only two ways that we have been able to handle that. Everything else is uh, uh, icing on the cake. So all the work we have done, uh, much to, uh, you know, I would hate to say that, but much to uh, the 40 years of work, I would look at that's it probably added uh, that uh, in bits per second, initial systems were like a fraction of a bit per second, like point. Or five, we probably are at 0 0.5 to 1 bit per uh, second per hertz. Today, a factor of 20 to 40. Uh, our collective, you know, if you have to think about, okay, all my contributions, it probably was maybe a small incremental fraction going from 0 0.5 to 0 0.07, something like that. You know. It's a, a very humbling experience to be in a field and then, you know, uh, uh, see so many other, the, that well tested idea, that ideas that have stood the test of time really have made the biggest difference. Uh, the fourth important thing, uh, because of the nature of wireless, uh, uh, you have to understand the channel. So the characterization of the channel uh, uh, is extremely important. And then uh, today, for example, the reason we actually are able to think about, we can actually use millimeter wave for 5G, uh, uh, is because of work uh, that was done by people like Ted Rapp Rappaport at NYU, who has you know, by, uh, probably uh, late 2000s said, okay, you know, let me actually go and make all kinds of measurements uh, of uh, how millimeter wave propagates in uh, places like Manhattan, how much gets absorbed, how much actually gets reflected. Uh, is it even possible to communicate with millimeter wave? Uh, what about uh, how much of uh, reflections happen? You know, are there too many? Uh, uh, is delay spread a huge problem? Uh, all those kinds of issues. So. Uh, uh, you know, the fundamentals of uh, communication begin with thou shall know the channel. Thou shall know the channel and uh, know, understanding the channel is very, very critical. There are some recent, actually, I've seen activities. Uh, you know, one of the problems with cellular, we always think is, hey, you know, uh, these channels are incredibly hard to communicate with and you have to do all kinds of complex signal processing. Uh, and the reason has to do with the fact that there are so many reflections. And these reflections can add destructively, causing all kinds of problems uh, in terms of fading and so on. And uh, 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 you know, there is a, a startup <coughs> whose name just es escapes me uh, for a second. Uh, Hamid or Andrew may know. Uh, they actually uh, are uh, looking at how to transmit signal in the so-called delayed Doppler domain, uh, and essentially. Uh, are able to show some very interesting performance, but I don't know uh, because uh, uh, there's not a lot of academic research done in that space. Uh, it's called Cohere Technologies. That's the name of the company. Harari, yet, is, the, Harari. Uh, Harari is the owner. And the owner yeah. uh, so the, so the, uh, uh, because uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we like to, you know, as engineers, we like to do is that there is a wealth of evidence. Uh, we want to do research. We need to make sure that that ex whatever they say can be replicated by so many people uh, uh, and we improve. And then it becomes adopted as a standard. That has not happened with that. So because of that, uh, 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 it is not clear. But it is interesting to note that there is still a lot of research to be done in waveform designs. How do we design signals for the cellular channel or multi wireless channel? Still seems like an interesting problem based on the fact someone goes and funds tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, to your company to say, let's see if you can build something interesting. Uh, so the early pioneers of that, again, going back uh, into the 40s uh, from Bell Labs, but then the channel models that we use typically uh, are built on it was called the Hata models, the Okimura, uh, Okimura from Japan. Uh, indoor models still very widely used for wireless LAN, uh, pioneered by Bell Labs, uh, uh, our colleagues, Valenzuela and uh, Adel Saleh, and then millimeter wave, I mentioned Ted Rappaport as an example, and many others. So this is very critical. Uh, so that's generation one ideas, right? Understand the channel frequency reuse, uh, uh, handoffs, and uh, uh, cell splitting. That's generation one. Analog systems were based on that, and they started building it. You now move to 2.0. Uh, the 2.0 is still digital, the first generation digital technology. And probably the most important thing here, uh, and I uh, should remember, I should have added one more uh, title, was the introduction of digital transmission in both GSM as well as North American TDMA systems. Uh, and they were very low level modulations. Uh, uh, however, due to the 
fact that the signals actually, uh, you have multipath, you have reflections, uh, and you have rapid fading, uh, you needed to actually equalize. Uh, and uh, 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 the, uh, may, the most important contribution there was, uh, uh, many of you may heard of his name, uh, uh, founder of uh, Qualcomm, uh, Witterby. Uh, 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 Witterby algorithm uh, is a, uh, was kind of the de facto way to uh, demodulate, equalize the signal. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, uh, now of course, the important thing is they all use convolutional codes. So I think Peter LIS from MIT actually was the inventor of convolutional codes. I could be, you know, I think if I name, so I should have added his name. Uh, but uh, the people who realized that uh, the Witter B algorithm actually is a maximum likelihood sequence estimator uh, was, uh, were Forney and Ungerbach. Uh, so they actually came up with two different formulations uh, of the Witterby algorithm, so-called white and match filter approach to equalization by Forney, and the match filter approach by Ungerbach, and both those approaches were used in the very initial digital cellular systems by various companies uh, for equalization. And uh, you know, again, if I were to go and say, you know, you should really uh, know some important concepts about uh, 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 the you know the, the evolution of wireless, uh, uh, I would look at those papers and then understand. Uh, 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 the work of uh, Witterby through those papers. Uh, now, today we take everything. So that's, uh, you know, uh, in my view, the fifth most important contribution, along with the work of uh, uh, LAS and on convolutional codes. Uh, so uh, that's a very important thing. But uh, uh, probably underappreciated uh, is the fact that uh, because we all take this for granted now that we can actually talk. Uh, but uh, uh, again, Yender would know this uh, because uh, uh, you know he was a, a significant contributor in many ways to this piece of the work. Uh, was uh, if you were in the 80s, this was probably the one of the hottest topics. How do we essentially transmit speech reliably during this uh, uh, over these channels? And uh, the problem was that the channel bandwidth was limited, which means you needed to compress speech. Uh, 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 roughly speaking, PCM speech was 64. Uh, kilobits per second, and you needed to get down to eight kilobits, a factor of eight. And uh, 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 the uh, 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 there were a, so so while digital speech compression uh, and getting to the end goal, uh, thereby mid 80s was probably the most important contribution. It it took about 15 years uh, to get there, starting in the very early uh, late eight, late 60s. Vishnu uh, Atal and uh, Schroeder actually came up with something called adaptive predictive coding. Uh, that was the late 60s work, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, that's when they started formulating that uh, essentially they started using the model of a vocal tract to actually say, you know, uh, 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 you know, in many ways it actually reminds you of uh, things like machine learning we do today. You know, they said, can I come up with models of uh, uh, a vocal tract? You know, I'm exciting the data by uh, 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 some noise. Uh, sorry, I'm exciting the vocal model of a vocal tract by noise, and the output should be as close as possible to the speech signal, and I'm going to figure out how to essentially minimize some error, right? So that was kind of the starting point, and uh, 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 what really spurred the development uh, of uh, ultimate speech coder was this vector quantizer work of uh, uh, Enders' advisor, uh, Bob Gray from Stanford. Uh, he came up with vector quantization, uh, which is uh, k-means clustering. So we keep inventing you know, uh, terms for all these things uh, again and again. Uh, ultimately, uh, uh, that led to the so-called closed loop, uh, clo code book excited linear predicting prediction coder by Atal and Schroeder. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I asked Atal how this invention came about. This paper was published in ICC 1983. Uh, Bishnu is his first name. He said, well, uh, Someone, the ICC organizer asked me if I would write a paper. He said yes. Uh, about two months before the uh, paper deadline, he had absolutely no clue what he was going to write. He said, I need to do something. It turned out that uh, 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 Bell Labs had just gotten a, one of the few places in the world which actually had just got a Cray computer. So he said, let me actually try and see what I can do with Cray. Okay? And he actually said, why not actually go and uh, create a massive Gaussian code book and I will transmit each and every one of the signal through the model of a vocal tract. Uh, 
and see which one is closer to the speech signal. It took one day to process one sentence on a Cray back then. Uh, and it turned out they got, ended up with a fantastic performance, and that became his ICC paper. Okay, so he was thinking it was not truly a practical thing, but it was a Cray computer. Literally two years later, that became a speech coding standard. Someone got that, someone from Motorola, uh, actually that much to the chagrin that Bell Labs didn't do it. Someone from Motorola got that entire process reduced to something implemented, uh, that is implemented on a single DSP, and that became part of the uh, first uh, digital standard. Uh, so. Uh, these are all very interesting uh, anecdotes and stories uh, uh, which uh, you typically miss out. You may not even study about speech coding anymore, uh, but really this dominated the area of research, uh, a big part of cellular research through the 80s and probably well through the early 90s. How do we end up with very high quality speech compression? We take it for granted today. Uh, so uh, that is a uh, very important contribution. Uh, and uh, uh, I can imagine, for example, today, uh, 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 us replacing this whole thing by some machine learning algorithm and saying, hey, you know, how do we compress speech? How do we do sp reliable speech transmission over wireless channels? In fact, there was a paper in uh, uh, ITA in San Diego where a, a student from UK had precisely done that for the majors, claiming a factor of 50% uh, uh, improvement over uh, JPEG, uh, over noisy channels by doing these kinds of things, over optimal JPEG plus matched uh, channel coding. Uh, so I can see these kinds of technologies being re-looked at in the context of next generation and seeing what else can we do, perhaps for even higher quality than where we are today. Uh, let me skip that. Uh, 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 now, uh, this becomes, now we are getting into, you know, those are all still a little bit classic before in some ways many of your times. Uh, and um, uh, now we get into fairly interesting, uh, the, probably where your, you know, my expectation is this is probably where communication theory is being introduced to your communication systems concepts are being introduced to you today, uh, 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 mid 90s. So clearly, spread spectrum, uh, Qualcomm uh, introduces that, actually shows very significant capacity improvement over the existing 2G systems of those days. Uh, leading to uh, CDMA technology adoption, and then later the wideband CDMA 3G. Uh, even today, uh, near my home, which is barely 10 minutes away, I seldom get LTE. It reverts to, uh, CD, to CDMA technology. Uh, so uh, uh, it's being used. Uh, direct sequence spread spectrum and error control coding uh, uh, became a major part of, and they used extremely complex convolutional codes uh, in the first generation. Uh, uh, compared to what back then. Uh, and then orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is now part of every single standard, uh, was introduced in 802.11ag. I will talk about that. Modern error control coding was introduced in 3G, turbo codes, uh, 93. So you will begin to see, you're beginning to see kind of uh, uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, I will show, is a 60s concept. You began to see that only in early 2000s. Turbo codes, on the other hand, was introduced in 93. You already saw that in 99 and standards, or, uh, but you know, in standards, but it became uh, uh, deployed in uh, uh, 2000. Uh, and, the two, and much to my surprise, the day I visited Broadcom for the first time in 99, uh, Broadcom had already built a 8PSK turbo port for satellite systems. I was, I was totally shocked uh, that uh, and it was moving fast into your product. So uh, the adoption of these technologies by 90s became faster and faster, primarily due to uh, uh, power of Moore's law, we could get it done. Uh, 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 so feedback. The other piece that is extremely important, you're beginning to see more and more of feedback in these systems. Uh, again, a very underappreciated uh, 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 topic, uh, but without feedback, fast power control for uh, cellular, for CDMA systems, uh, you wouldn't have had CDMA. Uh, that was very critical. Uh, uh, Feedback become, is the basis now of every single cellular technology, or uh, wireless technology. MIMO, you you're providing feedback in order to figure out, hey, you know, how do I essentially uh, uh, do beam forming? Uh, how do I weight the transmitted signals? All that. So MIMO completely relies on feedback now. Uh, adaptive coding and modulation relies on feedback. Uh, and then hybrid ARQ, uh, which actually I, kind of initiated as a part of 2G uh, edge technology uh, 
uh, is now part of every single cellular system and a lot of discussions around whether to introduce that now for next generation 800.11 as well. So feedback has become a very important part of all cellular systems. So improved file systems, modern error control coding, and feedback. So these three things essentially took, gave us, in my view, a factor of 20 improvement in uh, uh, performance in uh, cellular systems. Uh, and uh, so uh, the seventh most important contribution, in my view, uh, was uh, uh, CDMA technology. And uh, 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 you know, pretty much everything was put down in that paper. Uh, here are the primary contributors. Uh, uh, to that work, uh, Witterby being in the center, uh, Jacobs to his left, uh, and others, uh, Audrey Witterby to Witterby's right, uh, etc., and uh, uh, so on. I don't know, uh, oh, and uh, Padawani was one of them. I forgot who the other two were. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the main idea of CDMA was that in TDMA, you try to do interference avoidance. Uh, and uh, if there is an interference, you treated them as noise, and you try to try to keep the noise as low as possible. In CDMA technology, due to the power of spreading, you essentially were able to smear the interference and make it look like noise. And CDMA gave an advantage in the terms of spreading gains. Uh, so essentially, co-channel interference signals are smeared and averaged in CDMA. And uh, you needed fast power control because you never want one signal coming in, the co-channel interferer, to be dominant over the desired signal. So you needed to ensure they all arrived with roughly equal power. So fast power control was an extremely important part uh, of uh, CDMA systems. And then through a couple of other techniques, soft handovers and variable bitrate speech coding, they ended up with a capacity gain which really was uh, very significant over the first generation TDMA systems, which enabled this technology to be adopted by some of the carriers here as a second generation system. And then it became part of the entire 3G uh, framework. Uh, the, so that's the, the direction that uh, cellular went in the, let's call it early 2000s, late 90s to early 2000s. On the other hand, orthogonal frequency di division multiplexing became the way of, uh, uh, for uh, wireless LAN and uh, technology, and uh, uh, the, uh, it was, you know, this technology is, uh, uh, essentially the problem was as channels became more and more complex and you wanted wider and wider bandwidths, uh, uh, and you wanted higher data rates. Okay, you wanted higher data rates, which means you had to go to wider bandwidths. Single carrier modulations became extremely complex uh, to manage. Uh, complexity of equalization and bandwidth, you didn't know how to combine MIMO. Uh, MIMO was an afterthought, meaning MIMO was not necessarily there in the first generation wireless systems. But it's not easy to combine MIMO with single carrier in a very straightforward way. So that was, you know, uh, uh, in retrospect, uh, probably better. But in those days, you know, at least we didn't know how to do all of that. Direct sequence CDMA, essentially, uh, if you want to go to very high data rates, you needed to do something called multi-carrier, multi, multi uh, uh, you have to assign multiple codes to a single user, and you end up with all kinds of intercode interference, uh, causing problems in terms of capacity for direct sequence CDMA. Uh, and combining with MIMO was also an issue. So uh, uh, this made people started looking at, uh, it made people to look at other modulation techniques and OFTM essentially. Uh, and again, you know, the right silicon technology, you know, from point of view of process, everything, Moore's law was all right there for us to adopt OFTM. It's not a new technology. It goes back all the way to uh, 1960s. First uh, paper was published or invented by Chang. Uh, I think I copied this from some communications magazine uh, drawing. Uh, 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 and then popularized. Uh, so Chang did the first OFTM barrier, essentially taking a channel. You're splitting it to narrower and narrower channels. And each channel would carry with its own data. That's, that was kind of the idea. Uh, and uh, you had to create, because these channels could, uh, you know, build these filters, you could interfere. Uh, it caused all kinds of issues. And then Weinstein basically showed, you know, if you do it very carefully, you can use FFTs and you can do everything with very nicely. So uh, uh, that was kind of uh, Steve Weinstein, also a Bell Labs contribution. The first application to mobile radio channels, uh, to my knowledge, was done by Len Semini. Uh, uh, also of Bell Labs, July 1985. Uh, and then uh, there was a very interesting, what I would call OFDMA, 
which is what we used to even as an access, not OFDM as a modulation technology, but also as an access technology, was proposed by uh, Aaron Weiner in 1991, I think. Uh, it was an internal Bell Labs report, which was never published. Uh, uh, he passed away a few hours later before he could write the paper. Uh, so uh, a lot of work that went on, uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, you know, uh, we felt more comfortable. The silicon technology was all right there to be able to adopt it for wireless LAN. Uh, so OFDM, essentially, in my view, is technology number, or important contribution number eight. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I would like to just, uh, I didn't give it a number nine, uh, but feedback in wireless systems, uh, in my view, is uh, unbelievably important. And there are a few other things I will highlight, uh, which were, uh, you know, uh, I think more attention should be paid to essentially uh, fast feedback and improved feedbacks in wireless systems. And I think there is enormous capacity to be gained in wireless systems uh, by exploiting feedback. Uh, I will skip this uh, uh, also uh, due to time. Uh, but uh, uh, you know you can uh, you know uh, you can see that the technology is getting extremely mature. Modern error control codes with turbo codes, not LDPC, but turbo codes were already part of, in my view, uh, the world of 3.0. So uh, now I'm beginning to, since this particular talk is focused on, let us call it the uh, lower layer advances, you know, physical layer a little bit of the link layer, uh, I'm beginning to now struggle with really figuring out what are the critical, critical advances. But probably there is one thing that we could definitely point to is MIMO. Right? What is MIMO? Multiple input, multiple output system. Sorry, I keep forgetting that this is not uh, necessarily a communications audience. Uh, so the idea is that you are using multiple antennas simultaneously to communicate in the same frequency and same time. So each antenna is probably is carrying a different bit rate, different data stream. Uh, your sec is, uh, first antenna is carrying you know data stream one, second antenna is carrying data stream two, and so on. And the uh, 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 you're using multiple antennas at the receiver uh, to separate the transmitted signals, and essentially uh, you're able to show uh, uh, a capacity gain that is essentially. Uh, linear with the number of antennas, uh, assuming equal number of antennas you have at the transmitter and receiver. So it's as if you have uh, increased the bandwidth proportional to the number of antennas. That was a major advance. And then the coding techniques associated with that. I will talk about that. Uh, so, uh, so in my view, you know, so now uh, going to my own space-time coding, uh, 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 so you are essentially using multiple antennas at both ends of the link. Uh, and uh, you're coding across all of them, uh, uh, both in time as well as space as well as frequency, and you're sending the data across, and the receiver somehow unravels all of them. Okay, that's kind of the idea. Uh, and uh, a very, very early pioneer of uh, this is a guy called Jack Winters. Uh, 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 he was not necessarily focused on improving data rates, he was focused on improving frequency reuse. Remember, uh, back in the 80s, I mentioned that frequency reuse was a very important topic of cellular, and people are trying to figure out how to bring frequencies closer and closer. Uh, Jack Winters really sp spent a lot of time looking at how to use multiple antenna technology to essentially reuse frequencies tightly packed. Uh, and uh, he actually showed uh, some very interesting results. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes we get, uh, you know, the, the theory of what he did is exactly the same for MIMO, except that he didn't put it in the framework of MIMO. Uh, so uh, in many ways, uh, 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 he deserves a lot of credit, but he didn't st stretch the limits of possibilities, is one way to think about it. Uh, uh, really, the, uh, from an information theoretic point, viewpoint as well as architecture, there were two people, uh, 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 Teletar, uh, who was in the mathematics of communication and Bell Labs, and Jerry Foskini and Gans, who was in the, I forgot the exact uh, uh, department, but also at Bell Labs, uh, uh, all our colleagues, uh, they actually did some of the very early work on uh, uh, MIMO uh, and made it uh, popular, for, both from a showing that the information theoretically, uh, because you know, uh, it is important to know what are the limits of capacity. So they, first of all, show that Shannon capacity gains actually increase linearly with the number of antennas between the transmitter and the receiver. It actually is the minimum 
of number of antennas. If you have, say, 10 antennas at the transmitter and 8 antennas at the receiver, the capacity gain will be proportional to 8, uh, not 10. So it increases linearly uh, with the minimum of the two. Uh, and they showed that. And then Foskini went on to actually build some very interesting architectures uh, called Bell Labs Advanced Space Time Processing uh, that essentially became the, uh, that uh, jump-started enormous amount of research work in this field. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that was all very good. Uh, the people who essentially get tremendous credit for this uh, uh, is Paul Raj and Kailak uh, because the fundamental patent on MIMO essentially uh, uh, was, uh, uh, belongs to Paul Raj at Stanford. Uh, and this is also, these things are very interesting to listen to. If you get, get a chance, you should talk to them on how we discovered MIMO. Uh, uh, I don't have the time to go into it, but it's a very interesting story uh, of how we discovered that. Uh, and then uh, uh, a bunch of us, uh, independent of MIMO, uh, for various reasons, were focused on something called space time coding, and the two all gelled together. Uh, 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 so we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so I talked about winters. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, um, maybe a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. So let me skip. Uh, I mentioned everything. I will leave the presentation so you can circulate for those you want. Uh, 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 but let me actually uh, uh, just say a little bit. Uh, we talked about winters. Uh, we talked about uh, this. Uh, let me uh, move on to. Uh, uh, so a whole bunch of us, uh, and I've included Hamid here too, uh, invented this whole field called space-time codes. Uh, and I won't go into the details. And the reason I want to mention this uh, is kind of uh, uh, is a lesson in uh, thinking. Uh, you know, so it was more a, more a lesson. We did phenomenal amount of work. Uh, uh, we produced probably the best space-time codes. Uh, and, uh, 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 but that did not get into any of the standards. The space-time code that got into the standard actually was a wonderful work done by this person called Siava Shalamauti. Basically, it is the simplest code imaginable. Okay, he basically showed that uh, essentially you take two data streams, C1 and C2, you map it, C1 and C2, the first and the second antenna, you take the negative conjugate of what was transmitted in the second antenna and transmitted at the next time instant in the first antenna, and then the conjugate of C1 in the uh, second antenna. You can think of this as the simplest code possible with MIMO. Okay. This became uh, adopted in standards. It actually provides you with very interesting gains. We build codes which provided a lot more gains, but we missed the simple code. So sometimes it is worth, you know, the reason I'm pointing those, this out is I still remember the first time I actually uh, saw this code because he actually, uh, uh, this, we were connected. He was also with AT&T, but he was not part of our circle. You know, Hamid was part of our circle. But he was situated in Seattle. Uh, and uh, someone connected us saying, you know, the head of AT&T Wireless said, your work is extremely interesting. We should really figure out to make use of it. But we have a guy who says it doesn't work. He tried something, it doesn't work. Uh, and then uh, we connect with him, and then he says, it should work, but it is not working for me. And then he sends the software, you know, his C code. It turns out that he had a bug in the code. That's the reason it didn't work. And Wahid, I think, was the one who figured out the bug. So, uh, so uh, Alamotic code. So there are really very few codes which actually have people's names associated with codes. Uh, Hamming code is one of them. Reed Solomon code is one of them. Alamoti is one of the few. You know, uh, so it's uh, it's it's a great piece of work. Very uh, uh, intuitive, but uh, uh, we missed it. Um, the other one, uh, actually, this was uh, something uh, I'm not sure should be number 10, uh, location. Uh, you know, it's so critical uh, for us. I won't go into the detail, but GPS is now in every single phone. If you had actually, I remember talking in very early 2000s to all the major cellular manufacturers, asking between Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and location technology, which technology would you want in your phone if I have $2 to spend? And the answer was always location technology. Which technology is the least important? Uh, Wi-Fi. Which technology is probably the second most? Bluetooth. It actually went the other way, uh, meaning Bluetooth got first, Wi-Fi got second, then uh, 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 GPS was the last technology that essentially got into all these phones. And really, uh, the we know the power of navigation, the we know the power of location, so many things we do today. So I, I gave location number 10, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. There are a few things I'm still thinking about. The thing I did not cover, and this is my last slide, uh, security. Uh, 
security is so critical, as I mentioned, we don't worry about the fact that my cell phone is getting, uh, 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 you know, is, uh, uh, is being broken. Uh, I, you know, you can always take the SIM card and do things with it, but as long as, you know, uh, I, I don't, as I mentioned, I don't worry about the fact I can roam into your Vodafone network and it, things work well. I don't need to worry about carriers. Uh, they really thought about it extremely well. Uh, uh, in speaking to some of the people like David Goodman, uh, uh, NYU, who retired from NYU, when I speak to him, he thinks that everything I said was okay, but he thinks that these three, evolution of the network from circuit to all IP, uh, I think to him is extremely critical. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so they, you know, they, they've been extremely thoughtful about how to ensuring we can actually have a phone with a reasonable battery power. You know, so you cannot do that simply through building better circuits. The network has to be built. The protocols have to be built so you can actually go to sleep. You can actually do all kinds of things. So they, from day one, they have actually thought about how to engineer your cell phone for at least a reasonable day of, you know, fraction of a time of a day of a battery life, right? So those, t in my view, are definitely key. Uh, but the list will expand from more than ten, and I have to figure out how to drop, what to drop. So if I keep the uh, but uh, as a part of a course, I would be covering that in terms of key contributions. The future, what are the key contributions? Time only will tell. Uh, it's becoming more and more interestingly network-oriented. Millimeter wave, uh, massive MIMO. Uh, massive MIMO is really not massive MIMO. Uh, uh, Cloud RAN is getting introduced. Radio access network. RAN stands for radio access network. And then as we go into 5G, beyond 5G frontiers to be conquered, we still don't have a good appreciation of how to handle co-channel interference. Uh, we, we know how to avoid it. Uh, we know how to treat it as noise. But we don't do anything else with co-channel interference. Uh, 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 we really don't do a good job of marrying the licensed spectrum and unlicensed spectrum. A lot of work has been done in the world of academia, uh, but not much from the point of view of practice. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the world is typically very divided between the licensed carriers and unlicensed carriers, although majority of your mobile traffic goes over the unlicensed spectrum. The carriers actually would be in deep trouble if all the traffic, traffic were to move from the unlicensed world to the, uh, to the licensed world, and most of that goes over via the SLAM. Uh, and then uh, for something like 6G, which will happen 10 years from now, knowing everything we know today and forgetting everything we know today, if, I, if I'm giving, giving you now a clean slate, uh, uh, what would be a greenfield cellular network? I think uh, uh, I would start with that. Uh, and that essentially is how you will uh, create new key technologies for someone to give a talk 20, 30 years from now. Thank okay. you. Yes. Let's thank the speaker. Before questions, I have two announcements to make. Uh, one is that our speaker will be available between 3 and 4 in Engineering Hall, room 2210. 2210. And the second announcement is the check-in password. It's the word new, N-E-W, with all small letters. Any questions? Yes. So, <clears throat> there's a lot of buzz about 5 g and then there was a lot of buzz about 6 g here. Uh, before. Somehow 60 years didn't pick up because there was a problem with the user experience when you started to be informing the user move around and uh, in some respects 5G is very similar. Yeah. Uh, but it seems poison to fail as 60 gigahertz. So what, what is your take yeah. on that? So I can uh, so the reason 60 gigahertz failed in my view was that the standards became too uh, six, 60 gigahertz of, if the four see it all you have to figure out what is it that you want to do. Okay, what is the true application, right? So the problem was 60 gigahertz said I'm going to do one gigabit. I'm using one gigabit as an example. Wireless LAN started giving one gigabit, right? So, and it was a very mature technology. No one is going to go and put down, hey, I will now put another $5 into my phone for getting a gigabit for what reason, right? So, uh, so the issue always comes down to what do I do with, it's not technology for the sake of technology, but what am I going to do with it, right? So the, in my view, I had very early discussions on 60. It was a big mistake to afford, made it very complex. What they should have focused on was ultra short. Ultra short, I leave this next to it, 
I, I will essentially be able to move things between my phone and other devices extremely fast over a very, very small distance. It could have been, let's call it a simple add-on solution to, without being forming, without MIMO, without complex codes, all kinds of things are extremely simple technology for point-to-point high-speed USB, wireless USB. They didn't do it. That is, so you have to go and say, here is a use case. We are going to focus and try, not to focus the industry on it. If you try to do too many things, it won't. So, hence, I don't think we should take the 60 gigahertz and say, hey, the reason millimeter wave is in trouble is going to be because of 60. Having said that, your concerns are all very valid. Okay, uh, can, I th uh, will millimeter wave eventually work? I suspect it will, because we have no choice but to not make it work, and the collective brains of the uh, whole industry and the academia, everything will make it work, is my view. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, then the question then becomes, uh, is it ubiquitous or is it a hole filling solution uh, that we will use it only in high density, all those kinds of things. Uh, I am skeptical of a fixed wireless access uh, solution like what is being deployed. Uh, for a very simple reason that, uh, uh, you know, Henry knows this much better than anyone else. Think about the world of cable. The entire cable as infrastructure has been deployed forever, you know. Depreciated. Everything is so. If they want to, if they want to compete, all they need to do is to go and say, "Hey, you know, I will reduce my cost in this neighborhood to twenty-five dollars." You know, and immediately uh, it becomes a very, very difficult situation for AT and T and Verizon to compete in fixed wireless space. And uh, you know, it cannot be a rural technology because there is no money. You cannot spend billions and say, "I will only do rural." You know, so really, uh, how do we use millimeter wave? Is an interesting question. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you can see T-Mobile, for example, being un downright unbelievably skeptical of millimeter wave as a ubiquitous mobile technology. Their CTO blasts Verizon and AT&T daily. Let's thank the speaker once again. Okay. Please feel free to ask a question. Uh, I was just wondering about the fiber to the home. It looks like with all the bandwidth with the 5G and the others, we don't hear much about the fiber uh, optics. I think yeah, I would uh, defer this uh, to Henry, but uh, uh, because I'm not sure about where things are, but definitely there are countries which are very focused on fiber to the home. What, if I recall right, Henry, what's happening here, we are short, getting fiber closer and closer to the curve, okay? Uh, uh, so cable will get to gigabit, you know, with DOCSIS 5.0, all those kinds of things. DSL, uh, John Chaffee already talks about uh, uh, some ridiculous data rates, you know, uh, uh, but uh, uh, G.Fast is, I uh, forgot what data rates were, gigabit already. So he is talking about 10 gigabits next. Uh, through So G.Fast is already, again, the whole thing is you essentially bring fiber as close as, po as possible, not necessarily to the home. But you're driving and a lot of deployments are happening, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, in Orange County. You know, that's the problem, you yeah. know. Uh, uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, you're getting some. But yes, fiber into the home, Google, you know, had, you know, people miss, uh, underappreciate how difficult it is to provide these access technologies greenfield from scratch. When someone has spent uh, the last 50 years developing a business, developing infrastructure, customers, uh, and incrementally the technologies improve in the traditional world, you know. So we need to be, we need to be careful about the deployments of these. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yes. So um, just curious, there's a whole bunch of new technologies coming up on the horizon. May not be. I don't know if there's, I'm not a wireless network person, so may not be something fundamental. But things such as, you know, the new IoT long range, low power uh, variants, um, the, yeah, I would say even the intersection of these multiple different networks All right. existing at the Oh, it is time. absolutely, you are totally right. So the, uh, I use, for example, the sh uh, licensed and unlicensed spectrum. It's a very good example where uh, uh, carriers really did not consciously tried to offload, but are very happy things are getting offloaded, okay? Uh, they were so much against wireless LAN. Nearly, in many of the countries, uh, uh, 60, 70 percent of the traffic into your phones goes through Wi-Fi. Here, uh, uh, we did a, you know, I, I help a small startup. Uh, on one of the recent measurements we did with about 1,000 people, you ended up with nearly uh, 70 percent of the traffic of that major carrier going, is getting offloaded through Wi-Fi. So, 
the, uh, and they were totally shocked to know that was the number, right? And we were actually saying it can be 85 and you can still get the same quality, right? So, uh, uh, but the carriers are very reluctant to embrace this because they somehow feel, hey, I'm charging a customer and then if I'm going and saying most of it, uh, and I'm, uh, 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 you know, in a kind of a public way saying, I'm going to move that all through some other network, uh, you know, uh, it's going to result in some disaster. You know. So even these end-to-end -end technologies, right? So I mean, they don't necessarily have to use. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but having said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, if they don't have to use it, then you have to ask: Is someone else actually going to build those wide area, low cost networks? LoRa being an example of that, where I forgot some French company got hundreds of millions of dollars, right, to build all of those. Whether uh, Carriers will embrace it, whether they can create a business model, those time will tell. Technology exists. You know, you typically, you know, uh, uh, the wisdom of Broadcom uh, for me uh, has been that almost any technology we want, we can create. Uh, it's really a question of, is there a business model around it? You know, otherwise it won't go anywhere. Right? That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. And what is interesting is wireless LAN actually grew without a business model. 